Good evening. Good evening, and welcome to Bloyd College. Welcome to our 17th annual Weisberg Chair in Human Rights Address. Tonight, we are particularly honored to be joined by our new friend and current Weisberg Chairholder, Eskander Nagash, Senior Vice President for Global Engagement for the United States Committee for Refugees and Immigrants himself. A refugee to the United States from Ethiopia, Mr. Nagash has established himself as one of the most influential promoters of the human rights of refugees from around the world. You might think that every college and university has an equivalent of a Weisberg week. You might think that such a smart idea, bringing someone of purposeful consequence to campus to interact with faculty, students, and staff, not for an arm's length visit, a drive-by lecture, or collect my speaker's fee and on to the next college, to bring someone to campus for a full contact tour of duty, you can sleep next week tour of duty, would be something widely adopted. You might think that such a smart idea would be everywhere at Lawrence, at Williams, at Middlebury, at Yale, you would be wrong. Only Beloit College has a Weisberg week. Indeed, Mr. Nagash has paid enormous tuition bills to send four of his five children to colleges that do not have Weisberg weeks. His youngest child is not yet old enough to have overlooked the only college with a Weisberg week. <laughs> you have an opportunity, Eskinder, to learn from your mistakes with your youngest child. I have brought some materials from the admissions office for you to give to your daughter upon your return. A Weisberg Week, the only Weisberg Week. This Weisberg includes a discount coupon. <laughs> yeah, we're doing all we can. Yeah. This does not happen by accident. It starts with the college's mission, whose glorious first sentence reads, Beloit College engages the intelligence, imagination, and curiosity of its students empowering them to lead fulfilling lives marked by high achievement, personal responsibility, and public contribution in a diverse society, a mission which has wonderfully found purchase in one of our graduates and her father, Nina and Marvin Weisberg, a mission potentiated through their generous support of the Weisberg program, a mission personified this week in Eskinder Nagash. For your time here, Eskinder, and more broadly, for this week, we must pause and thank the two whom I have just mentioned, Marvin and Nina Weisberg, the two whose vision, enthusiasm, and philanthropy makes this college and this world Better. Although they are not here tonight, I hope you join me in thanking them both. It takes two to tango. The magic of Weisberg Week starts with an inspirational chair. Mr. Nagash, that is you but it must also include an engaged community, a community who boldly takes on their responsibility to engage our chair in the most substantive way. Among the things I love about Weisberg Week are the previous weeks and months of preparation that so many members of the community take so seriously so that we are ready to take full advantage of the time we have with you, Mr. Nagash. 
Other schools do not have Weisberg Weeks in part because they are unwilling to take on the commitment of this level of preparation. The Beloit College community recognizes an opportunity when it knocks. It is one of our greatest attributes. These weeks and months of preparation require extraordinary leadership and vision on the ground, on this campus. There are three members of our community that I want to recognize who work tirelessly, brilliantly, creatively, and generously to make this week possible each year. Our Menger Family Professor of International Relations, Beth Dougherty, our Director of International Education, Betsy Brewer, and our Associate Director of International Education, Josh Moore. It is their tenacity and focus on the importance of an undergraduate education at Beloit College that emphasizes the integration of internationalism into every department and program on campus, a mission that is at the heart of the Weisberg Residency that helped earn Beloit College the Senator Paul Simon Award for Campus Internationalization. Please join me in thanking Beth and Betsy and Josh for developing and implementing a framework that makes this, makes the most of this precious opportunity and that promotes the mission of this great school so effectively. It's terrific to see so many of you here tonight. Let me turn over the podium to Professor Beth Dougherty, who will properly introduce our featured speaker and honored Weisberg chairholder, Eskander Nagash. Beth. Two quick orders of business before we start. So after um, Mr. Nagash finishes his remarks, we will have a question and answer period. In order for us to uh, live stream this, we need you to use the microphone. And so there will be two people who are walking around with mics. So if you want to ask a question, please make sure you draw their attention. The second thing is we have two additional um, open events coming up and during Weisberg Week. Friday um, at 4 o'clock in Richardson Auditorium, we will have um, local individuals who work with the refugee and immigrant population in both Rock County and in Rockford. Uh, and then on Saturday, we will have a, a, a panel of academics who are talking about asylum policies in the United States and the United Kingdom, including topics such as detention and unaccompanied minor children. That is at 10 a.m. in Richardson Auditorium, and I, I hope to see many of you there. A refugee himself from Ethiopia, Eskinder Nagash has devoted his career to serving the needs of refugees and immigrants. He currently serves as the Senior Vice President for Global Engagement for the United States Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. Mr. Nagash brings over 35 years of experience working on behalf of refugees and immigrants and managing nonprofit social service organizations. Prior to joining USCIR, he was appointed by the Obama administration to serve as the Director of the Office of Refugee Resettlement in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where he served from 2009 to 2015. With a budget of over $1.5 billion, the ORR is the largest government-funded refugee resettlement organization in the world. During Mr. Nagash's tenure, ORR provided essential services to more than 850,000 vulnerable people through its resettlement program, rescue and restore anti-trafficking program, and the unaccompanied children's program. Additionally, Mr. Nagash has served as Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer of the International Institute of, uh, of Los Angeles, as well as served on the board of a number of other nonprofit organizations. He received an Outstanding American by Choice Award from DHS U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, which recognizes naturalized American citizens who have made significant contributions both to their community and to their adopted country. In 2010, the International Rescue Committee honored Mr. Nagash as one of 10 distinguished men and women whose stories of hope and transformation epitomize the refugee journey. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Skinder Nagash. Good 
Good, good evening. Uh, it has been, I believe, many, many years uh, since I came to a Wednesday night Bible study class at the church. <laughs> uh, so uh, that was really a very long introduction. <laughs> I feel old now, you know. <laughs> uh, I want to first thank uh, President Berman, Nina Weisberg, and Mar Marvin Weisberg, found, including the foundation, uh, Beth and Elizabeth. Uh, has been very generous to me and have been a wonderful host. Um, Betsy actually came with me to the Beloit Rotary Club yesterday. I felt that she was my parole officer. <laughs> uh, so it's actually a great privilege and a great honor to be invited as a chair of the Weisberg Foundation here at this distinguished uh, college. First, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, at the same time, I want to share with you a message. Nobody told me I should share with you, but I believe millions of people will actually do this. So on behalf of about 65 million refugees and IDPs, I wanted to say thank you for inviting me. It's really not about my journey or the, the thing I have done working on behalf of refugees. It's your decision. It is your, your value statement that says to me that there is a voice for the voiceless. And the decision to bring somebody, you know, I have not achieved anything. I don't really have any credential for that matter. I am not a subject matter expert in anything. Uh, the only thing is I have been uh, blessed and privileged to be in the service of others uh, for many, many years. So again, I wanna make sure uh, that that the Weinberg Foundation, the university, knows that I am here on behalf of refugees, who are actually some of them languishing in a refugee camp for 20 years, 30 years, and some of them for 50 years. Thus, I am here on their behalf to share their stories, because that's really what I do. As you heard it, you know, I became a refugee, a stateless, a young, at the young age, due to the political crisis in East Africa. For the past four decades, I have been privileged to serve refugees and immigrants, Jewish refugees from the former Soviet Union, Vietnamese refugees after 1975, Cambodian refugees, Laotian refugees, Hmong refugees, Iranian refugees, and more. Regardless, I always managed to see myself through them. And because of that experience, I believe I am a better person, not necessarily a good manager. Gandhi once said, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in serving and servicing of others. I have tried my best to find myself through that service. As I said, I'm not a, a policy expert uh, on international law or international protection. I see myself a former refugee first, an advocate, and sometimes, because of my age, a storyteller. 
I shared this story with you on Monday at lunch, but please forgive me that I've been repeating a lot of things this week. <laughs> so I'm going to repeat it again. <laughs> a Holocaust survivor once asked, looking back over the years, what would be his single most achievement? One that not only makes him feel proud, but also one that gives him fulfillment and a sense of purpose, given his ordeal, that is. For those who knew the man up close, there were many things. He could have cited his remarkable multi-million dollar business, success and everything, topping the list, the top list. There was an incredible achievement for an orphaned and broken young man who arrived in the new world was nothing more than a pocket money. But his answer was quick and straight from the heart. He said, the stories, he said empathically, telling the stories of some of those who never got a chance to tell theirs. It means a whole world to me. That was his answer. My favorite verse in the Bible, since this is a church, is there is a verse that says, go out and preach the gospel all the time. But when necessary, use your words. Well, so tonight, I'm going to do the gospel preaching, and I'm going to use my words. So I wanted to share with you the global refugee and immigrant crisis from a refugee perspective. The global refugee system is at historic crossroad. Irrespective of what the media, in my humping opinion, reports on the so-called refugee crisis, the fundamental cause of refugee influx to developing countries is the policy of protected refugee human warehousing. Treating refugees as criminals and dangerous and then keeping them like animals caged in an open prison for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years without hope with no dignity is, for me, what I refer to be a human warehousing. That's really what happened when we say about refugee crisis. I understand international actors and refugee advocates to protect refugees have done much, but the current global refugee and IDP situation is, in my view, a, a tipping point. Today, but the recent UNHCR report, refugees and IDPs, these are internally, internally displaced people worldwide, have exceeded 65 million people for the first time since the post-World War era. If refugees, internally displaced people, and asylum seekers made up of one nation's population their country will be the 20th largest in the world. The great majority of current refugees and IDPs are languishing in dreadful and isolated refugee camps or in urban slums for decades or even generations without hope and human dignity. Just to mention a few, prot a few prot protracted camps, Eritrean refugees in Eastern Sudan. They have been in refugee camp since 1967. 50 years. In Eastern Kenya, a refugee camp called Dadaab. Refugees have been staying there since 1991. When I went to visit them in 2010, 
total population was 350,000. I believe at this time that number is, is close to 500,000. And they have been there, uh, and it seems to me nothing is going to be changing very soon. And then in, in Asia, 3 million Afghans in Pakistan since 1979. Three million people has been without a state, without a place, as a refugee, in another country since 1979. In Algeria, there are Sahrawi, Sahrawi refugees since 1975. These are just a few I wanted to mention to you. Uh, there are some who have been refugee camp for many, many decades. Unfortunately, given the global conflict, including terrorism and the upsurge of refugee and IDPs fleeing violence, the fundamental human right enshrined in the 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees and, as, and other protection instruments have been willfully and steadily ignored. Albert Einstein once said, the, sig the significant problems of our time cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. Although not in the 1951 convention, in the last 60 years, the international community has made refugee camp policy a long-term strategy of containment and countries of first asylum. The policy of containment has succeeded in keeping refugees in destitute camps for, for several generations with no viable future. However, the new generation of refugees have rejected this inhumane practice and decided to pursue alternative solutions by taking long, dangerous, treacherous trails in search of freedom. They chose to risk their life in search of freedom. You can say that they are actually escapees from a life sentence of refugee warehousing, no future in sight. By the way, 86% of refugees are hosted by poor countries, and some of them actually highly dependent on international donors. Once again, the international community's response to this influx has been the policy of denying refugees the right to live a normal and a decent life, forcibly returning them to first country of asylum, worse, trading them with another country, giving other countries, if you want to take some refugees, I will give you money, as long as you take them out of my country. Some of them are actually currently, as we speak, negotiating how much money they should receive if refugees are going to be returning. These practices, in my view, in my view are unlawful, morally indefensible, and I will say as a crime against humanity. I'm reminded that in 1938, when represent, <coughs> repre excuse me, in 1938, when representatives from 32 Western countries gather in the resort town of Ivan, yeah. Ivan, which is in southern France. It's now famous for its water. But in 1938, the delegates were there to discuss whether to admit a growing number of Jewish refugees fleeing persecution in Germany and Austria. 
After several days of discussion and negotiation, most countries, including Britain and others, decided to do nothing. This was in 1938. Martin Luther King once said, our lives begin to end the day we became silent about the, th about the things that matter. The ongoing and sometimes hostile domestic and international discourse around national security, fear, nationalism, and terrorism have increased the media spotlight on refugees. Therefore, as a former refugee with nearly 40 years of service to uprooted refugees and immigrants, I would like to share with you my global perspective on migration and refugee policy issues. Anti-immigrants and, and anti-refugee sentiments are increasing, and with them, extremism, nationalism, particularly in Europe, sometimes here, even in Africa, such as Kenya, racism, Islamophobia are on the, right, on the rise as well. A departure to historical support for refugees, refugee settlement in the United States, the refugee, the refugee issue, issue has become incre increasingly, increasingly polarized, excuse me. Opposition groups are louder and stronger than ever, and as sometimes passes, they became more experienced and effective in their tactics. This is compounded by the fact that many nations do not perceive cultural diversity as an advantage. They see different cultures as a threat to their own culture. Sensitivity is eroding and discrimination is becoming more acceptable. Misinformation and fear are rampant. With crime, health threats such as Ebola, Zika virus being interwoven into an anti-migrant, anti-refugee discourse. The media continue to, pro to broadcast stories and publish articles perpetuating this discourse to catch viewers' attention. This sentiment reinforces real-world discrimination. As, what, as we continue to observe often with apprehension, several consequential international events like the US election, the British decision to withdraw from EU, the French presidential campaign, and Holland, Turkey, Kenya, and Israel. On top of that, terrorism, a strained political environment, and the closure of camps due to national security concerns. These are the current challenges of the humanitarian refugee and immigrant challenges. The, the current refugee crisis proved to UNHCR also and international donors that the 20th century refugee protection policies are antiquated and disintegrating. For better or worse, refugee, refugees are no longer invisible and they show their aversion to protected warehousing by fleeing to unknown destination. In the policy world, the crisis has forged, forced some to acknowledge that the 1951 convention is not functioning as it should. It exposes the inherent weakness of the current system, which creates an opportunity to return to the original and true purpose and intents of the convention. Increasingly, NGOs, government groups, and other entities in the private nonprofits and public sectors are becoming multinational organizations. The population they, they serve or represent are becoming more diverse linguistically, et ethnically, 
and racial. This diversity offers a broad range of perspective as expanded network and reach into the global community. An opportunity for heterogeneous multilateral global movement in support of displaced populations. If we don't handle these challenges properly now, it has the potential to be a crashing blow to refugees and immigrants. In the meantime, opposing voices will, will increase in number and in volume. Unfortunately, many advocates were unprepared for the spotlight and have persisted in upholding the, the status quo rather than taking advantage of the political discourse to address the intrinsic flow of the current refugee management system and to offer a new idea, a new perspective. The international NGO community advocacy strategy is essentially to maintain the status quo regarding refugee treatment. Now, in my opinion, the public relation game is being lost as people who oppose immigration and refugees are increasingly louder and seem to receive more media attention than pro-refugee advocates do. However, the, advo the advocacy community has also failed to propose new ideas and has accepted the position definition of crisis. This instigates a sense of fear frames the issue as, as a threat to national security. We are now debating humanitarian response, mixing it with a national security response. It seems to me that compassion and outrage starting to be very selective. As certain groups, certain refugees, receive attention, while the overwhelming majority of refugees are warehoused in camps and continue to be overlooked. We are forced to see the entire global refugee issue through the Syrian crisis. In my opinion, time of the essence and the window of opportunity to influence a great number of minds may be closing there is an issue of language and labeling. Categorizing people as either refugees or migrant is simplistic, inaccurate, and even harmful. Those identified as fleeing poverty are not granted the same consideration as refugees. One warrants more sympathy than the other. In some cases, the level of refugee or migrant is used propel political arguments and deny rights under